As you, as you all know, each of these classes go on YouTube, and sometimes I edit out uh, different things in it. But, uh, before we get started, uh, I'd just like to say a few things in review. I know we have a couple of new students that I'd like to introduce. Uh, we've got uh, Steve Schwartz here. You want to tell the class maybe what you'd like to learn? Oh, I just anything that I don't know, I guess. All right. <laughs> are you an experienced player? Or you uh, a little bit. A little yeah. bit. Okay. Sounds About good. Probably one. average, I guess. All right. And as you see, the camera is right behind you. So that probably isn't the best place to stand. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Paul Williams. Paul Williams. All right. Welcome, Paul. How about you? Anything you want to share about yourself? Yeah, I started playing about 50 years ago, and then I quit for about 35 years, so I forgot most of what I did back in the old days. Okay. So you did play quite a bit back then. Back in the way back. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to uh, relearn some stuff and also maybe get rid of some bad habits. All right. That sounds good. Well, you're in the right place. We'll, we'll do what we can to help you out. A uh, couple of things. This is the third class. In the first two classes, we did a lot of important things. The main thing was how to stand correctly and aim. And a couple of things I want you to remember about aim, and this is probably the most important thing of all, is you never aim when you get down in the shot like this. The aiming is all done while you're above the shot. And you'll notice when I stand behind the cue ball and the four ball shooting in the corner pocket, I'm finding this target which is the very contact point of the four ball since it's straight up. But as I, as I look at that aim point, uh, my pre-shot routine kicks in. I'm ready, getting ready to shoot the shot. And if, you, if you've noticed, in every sport, people that uh, are making accurate movements, like in tennis or golf or any other sport, you have a basic pre-shot routine that's your comfort zone that you can do every time. Like uh, Steph Curry shooting a free throw. What does he miss one every, uh, every three games or something? You know, that's kind of the, the idea. But my pre-shot routine is simply find that target, see the center of the pocket, draw a line all the way back to the contact point. Right foot right on the line, left foot forward and swing down. And this is the critical point. If I'm not perfectly aligned, in other words, my body's not correctly aligned, I'll stand back up. And I'll redo my first shot routine until I get perfectly aligned each time. And you notice I'm taking some nice warm-up strokes. And you notice if you want to use this tool later, you see those dotted lines, you can see if your stroke is going straight through. So I, I encourage you if you want to try that. Another thing you can do that's very helpful to work on your stroke is just use the spot on the table. In other words, uh, in the first class, we were trying to make sure our, our, our stroke was, was aligned straight to the center of the clock. So even without shooting an object ball, we'll practice our pre-shot routine. But you can see the Q-tip it's right through straight. And you know, a lot of times you're going to notice it goes to one side or the other, and that's the kind of thing you can correct. Our, our friends here, Crystal and John, based on classes one and two, uh, gave me a couple of inventions. This one I really like, John. John worked hard on this uh, in, his, in his workshop, I imagine. But what he did, as he put this together, it really doesn't matter what ball we use. But again, we're going to practice shooting the ball in the corner pocket, but we're going to have this wooden uh, guide to help us to make sure the Q-tip's not going forward, left, or right. In other words, stroking straight through. Right foot in the line, swing down, left foot forward. A couple of nice warm-up strokes. That's and, really cool. Yeah, it's kind of neat. Thanks, John. I really appreciate yeah, I that. I had it on top of my cue. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> if it's okay, can I leave this around for people to try it today? Would that be all right? Okay, sounds good. 
He also came up with another tool that I love. This is really cool. Remember that wooden stick I put on the pocket the other day? Well, he built a, a permanent one. <laughs> now, for those of you that are new students to the class, this is really important. Because believe it or not, people don't always know where the center of the pocket is. Okay? And this is a guide to teach you that. And let me show you how it works real quick, because I think it's real important. John? You want to turn that uh, 90 degrees. You like it like that? Yeah, uh, so the ball can go underneath it. OK. Yeah, that's better. Oh, yeah, it'll actually have the string. Now, you notice where you attach the string in the middle? That's the center of the pocket that you always aim for. And you notice I put it at the outer jaw. I didn't put it back here. Because if I put his tool back here, the ball would hit the rail going at that center spot. The center of the outer jaw is where you aim on every shot. But I do want you to notice one thing real quickly. If I cut the 12 in the pocket, look where it goes in. In other words, uh, people that are inexperienced in pool don't cut it enough because they're aiming for the back of the pocket instead of the center of the outer jaw. And if I put it another way, like this, look what part of the pocket it goes in here. And on each time you shoot this, there's a bad side and a good side of the pocket, okay? If I shoot the 12, and I'm aiming back here, it's gonna hit the rail. You need to aim at the center of the outer jaw. Now I know that sounds a little strange, but it's a really important thing to learn. But anyway, I wanna thank John for inventing this cool tool. All right, today, we're going to talk about position. But before we get there, I just want to reiterate how important it is when you grab some chalk. I haven't really talked about this a whole lot, but chalking is really important. And if you watch good players, they pretty much chalk on every shot, right, Chuck? <laughs> now, a lot, of, a lot of players don't know the proper way to chalk your tip. And you notice the tip needs to be rounded, okay? And the reason for that is that the cue ball is also rounded. So, you know, like if I'm gonna hit a, hit a, a draw shot where I bring the cue ball back, I actually have to put it a little lower than I think because you're actually hitting it higher because the cue ball is rounded as well as the tip. And also, if your tip is too flat, it's much more likely to slip off the cue ball because you want as much tip to contact the cue ball as possible. That's why you need a shape on your tip like a dime or a nickel. And if any of you need help with that with your cues, I'll be glad to you know, work with you on that when we get together. But last time we, worked, we learned about the stop shot and how important it is. Now, if I'm going to shoot a ball in from this distance, I don't really need to go uh, too low on the cue ball. But the stop shot is really critical because you have to accelerate the cue all the way through the cue ball. And by doing that, the cue ball is going to slide along the claw, so when it makes the 12, it will stop dead. Now, from this distance, the stop, stop shot is no big deal. Going through my pre-shot routine, so I'm just going to hit it pretty much dead center. But watch the cue ball as it slides along the claw and stops. You notice I didn't hit it too hard. But what happens if I have a lot of distance between the two balls? Then you really have to accelerate through. In other words, to get the cue ball so it's sliding when it's pockets to the weapon. So from this distance, I'm actually going to hit the cue ball a little bit lower. Go through my normal pre-shot routine, nice and low. You can see from different distances, the stop shot requires a little bit more stroke and hitting the cue ball a little lower. 
Now, it's one of the best ways to practice up for a tournament. Long straight in shots where you have to stop the cue ball because it develops your stroke, which is crucial. And that's really one of the main things you want to learn from this class. Okay. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. And today we're going to look at playing position. Okay. In the first couple of classes, we worked on hitting the cue ball where you're aiming and developing a good stroke. Today, I want to work on position. Now, I put a couple of white reinforcers on the table just to show you how center ball hits, either high, middle, or low, can radically change where the cue ball's going. All right, on this first shot, and I want, I want some participation in this, okay. On the first shot, I'm going to roll the one into the corner pocket, hitting a high ball. Can anybody guess where the cue ball will come on this rail? Okay. Right there. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Over here, you say? I'm thinking somewhere in this gym. All right, all right, all right. Let's see what happens. And you'll notice that uh, there is a tangent line. And this is something that I have a tool for to show you. I'm not going to actually use this, but it's kind of important to, to see this. I'll turn this arrow towards the center of the pocket. Now the tangent line is where the cue ball will go if I hit a, hit a stop shot. And when I hit a stop shot at an angle, it's called a stun, okay? So on this shot, if I hit a stun shot, the cue ball will always take a 90 degree angle off the object ball. But when the shot I'm gonna shoot first is a rolling ball, which means that it won't take the tangent line. That rolling ball is gonna beat the tangent line to this side, just as Warren mentioned. But these are the shots that are crucial in playing position. You need to be able to master a follow shot, a rolling ball, a stun, and a draw. Okay, so this one, anybody else have a guess where the cue ball is going to go on this rail? Any ideas? Uh, how are you hitting it? Rolling ball, rolling ball? medium speed. Oh, yeah. Around here? All right. All right, let's, let's see where it goes. About the middle of those two diamonds. Now, the reason why I wanted to demonstrate that first is the majority of your shots at your level of play are going to be rolling balls. Okay? And the cue ball was rolling forward as it contacted there, so it beat the tangent line to this side, so it be way over there. All right, the so next shot we're going to shoot. Did that come straight back off the tangent line? I couldn't. Well, the tangent line was way up here. It beat okay, the tangent From where it hit, did it come straight back across? Pretty much. Okay. Pretty much. I didn't use any English. We're not, we're not going to get to English for class five. Okay. All right. Now, this time I'm going to hit a stop shot. It, at an angle, it's called a stun shot. Now, this time, anybody guess where the cue ball is going to land over here? Any ideas? Right there? Okay. All right, let's see what it does. And again, it will follow the tangent line to there. And angle in, angle out, I think Warren's pretty, pretty darn close if I hit it accurately. So a nice little stun shot, go through my pre-shot routine, get it dead center, and I have to stroke through it a little more this time. I'm generally about to this time. Generally. Yeah, go ahead. I've got a question for people like Warren. Yeah. Did you know where it was going to be because you worked out the math of the tangent line, or is that just experience? I mean, I, how are you thinking that's It's a combination of both. Okay. Yeah. yeah. When you see it a couple of thousand times, it, it sinks in, yeah. even if you got a hard hit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so it's kind of like the 10,000 rule of Malcolm Gladwell. 
You do something 10,000 times, you, it takes that long to master it, okay? Or you end up doing it really, really wrong. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. Let's do one more stun shot because it actually depends on what part of the pocket the cue ball, the object ball goes in. You can change it as much as a half a diamond or so. Do one more stun shot because this is a real one. I'd like you to practice this shot and really kind of determine where your cue ball is going to hit the rail and where it's going to hit the rail in a second. One more time. And that time, you notice it went in this side of the pocket. Let's do one more, and then we'll, we'll see what happens with the draw. Stun shot. Go through my whole pre-shot routine, swing down, take a few. And you saw it hit three places, here, here, and here. And that just, you know, that's how sensitive it is on what part of the pocket you pocket it in. Let's do that again, please. Okay. So what's what's your question? Any what? Um, you just I want to see. Just, I want to see it bounce okay. on the other rail. I'm right. paying attention to that part of it. So why don't you see it to see how it hit on that rail three times? Did I miss here? Um, the, Does the tangent line change? The tangent line changes oh. depending on what part of the pocket okay. you make it in. Like if I make it in this side of the pocket, the tangent line will be a little higher. If I make it in this side, it'll be a little lower. And if I hit it perfectly, it should come probably to about here, I would say about to one and a half diamonds up the rail. But that's the, type, that's the kind of precision you need to be a good pool player because making balls in pool is only half the battle. You've got to be able to position the cue ball. And one thing I really want you to learn in this class is that you don't need all that fancy English to, to be a good player. I mean, eventually, you'll get there and you can, you know, you'll learn that. But you have to master the center axis first, the vertical axis, because that way you can you can make the majority of your shots without English and be a very good player. All right, any guesses about draw now? Where's the cue ball going to hit here? You can scratch it aside if you wanted. Uh, well, no, I don't have that good of a stroke, <laughs> but that's that interesting thing to want to do. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's possible to pull it all the way back. All right. All right. Let's see how that would work. And again, Warren is right. There's more variation with draw because it depends on the speed I hit the draw. If you hit the draw with less speed, it'll take the draw sooner. If I hit it too hard, it won't take the draw as quickly. But I would say generally it should be about the middle diamond. And again, tangent line is here, it will probably go above it slightly, okay? depending on the speed. In other words, I'm just hitting a low backspin shot. It's going to be spinning backwards when it hits the 15. And you saw the thing curve, didn't you? In other words, as I, as I stroke through it, it started towards the tangent and curved. That was the backspin kicking in. You know, what I just showed you is really important to becoming a good pool player. Because if you can master those three strokes, you can, you know, really advance your game very rapidly. All right, why do we need to master those strokes? <laughs> Let's, let's give a few examples. Let's say you have solids <coughs> and uh, you're about ready to win the game. All right, how do I get position from the two to the eight ball to win the game? What kind of stroke will I need? 
Well, the last one I used was raw, right? Yeah. But well, the cue ball came down to here, right? Something like that. In other words, the quote, <laughs> and this is kind of important, the quote on your lesson today is, whenever possible, play position into the line of your next shot, not across. So draw would be okay. I could possibly get position. But the problem is, it will be crossing the line of my next shot. Because I'm either going to make the 80 here or there. So I want the cue ball to go into the line of my next shot. So what I'm going to do here is hit the stun shot. And that's the one I was looking for. See how it ends the line of the next shot. Look at how much room for error I have. If the cue ball stopped here, I'm okay, 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 okay. All that space I had to get good position on the next ball. If I were to use draw coming this way, I only had this much room for error. You see the idea? You always want the cue ball going towards the next ball. Let me just show you one real quick example of what I'm talking about. Let's see, I've got four stripes and an eight. One here, one here, one here. Yeah, I'm just kind of throw the balls out here a little bit. Okay, here's a position that might come up a lot of times. You have stripes in the game of eight ball. All right, now, the, well, obviously the 13 is the easy shot. <coughs> How should I shoot the 13 in order to follow the rule we just talked about? In other words, what ball should I play shape for? You see a pattern emerging. So if I we follow the rule whenever possible to play into the line of the next shot, all I need to do is roll the ball in. The tangent line's way up here to hit the 11. But if I roll it, it's going to beat the tangent line and come towards the 12 so I can make it in the side pocket. So literally a nice, smooth, rolling ball. So why wouldn't you yeah. set up for the 11? on the rail the reason the ball went that's over a there. great question the 11 is my key ball that's the one I want to save to shoot the 8 in other words the pattern I saw you go in reverse the 11 was a beautiful key ball and the pattern that's emerging now I just roll in the 12 I stop on the 9 and then play the 11 to get position on the 8 so you're all you're kind of looking ahead to make it as easy as possible, okay? So I don't really need to do anything, although I'd like to get straight in on the nine. So I'll simply roll forward a little bit to the rail and out. And again, I got straight in on the nine. And here's an example of a, one I can just stop. I don't want a lot of angle because I want to make the 11 and then shoot the, shoot the next. So a nice little stop shot. And then kind of roll forward to get a straight in shot. You kind of get the idea. Here's another, another example of that. Let's say I've got this. This is a good example. I got a couple of ways I can get shape on the eight, right, from the nine. I could do a high ball and come across like that. But that would be crossing the line, wouldn't it? What might be a better option to get on the eight? I'm sorry, what's the line? OK, the line is the line go, making the ball in the, in For the your next, next shot. shot. And your next shot. Oh, OK. So the line here. Could either be here, 
here into that pocket. Okay. Or here into this pocket. Other thing I wanted to show you too. If some of you are having difficulty with your stroke, you're welcome to use this. It's a really good uh, way to diagnose any issues that you might have. You can aim it at any pocket, put your cue ball on one end like this. And the neat thing about this tool is you can diagnose exactly how your stroke is going. In other words, I'm going to try to stop the cue ball right on the plastic. And you notice there's two red lines on this side and a dotted line going through. So, and also I can get feedback to see how my stroke accelerates through the cue ball. Also, it's another way you can really get your stroke lined up. Get your practice strokes released to it. Because it's staying on the dotted line. So there's a lot of different ways you can work with this. And make sure you're going accelerating through. You should be you know, around six inches, I would say, would be about the proper at most shots. Okay, I'm not sure if we have time today, but uh, would you like to go through a short racket football and talk about strategy and stuff like yes. that? Okay. Yes. All right. <coughs> and we're going to do a short rack because it's a lot less time consuming. And we're going to have a tournament the last day of class, and we're going to play short rack eight ball, okay? <laughs> Which means you can have four solids, four stripes, and an eight ball. <coughs> and to rack it, it's pretty random except for the eight in the middle. It's like nine ball. It's racked like nine ball with the eight in the middle. Okay. But this is, uh, makes it a lot more fun because when you've got all 15 balls, you know, games can go really slowly. So let's go ahead and just, we want to talk about the break today. Let me just open the rack and then we'll talk about what to do. Okay. Now let's say that I did make the seven ball. I made a solid. The rules today dictate that I don't have a group of balls until I make a called shot. So even though I made the seven ball, I would still have the ability to choose stripes at this point. Now, if I shot the 15 and missed it, it would be an open table for my opponent. Okay. But let's say I made the seven ball, and you know what? I like. I like the stripes better. And I even see a, a fairly decent key ball here. I could probably use, you know, either the 11 or the 15. But I'm going to have to shoot the 15 first. Solids don't look good, mainly because I don't have a decent shot. Of it. So what, what ball would you shoot first here if you had the stripes? Any ideas? What? 15? Yeah. And the 15 is giving me a lot of options. In fact, the more I think about this, I probably would use the 12 as a key ball, because if I get anywhere on the 12, I simply have to make it roll down for the 8. Right? So we're going to think about that first. So what I'd like to do here is play the 15, and all I have to do is draw back to make the 11 next. Save the 12 for last. See, I got a nice angle on the 12 for 
all they have to do is roll the cue ball down to the eighth. So it served a pretty good purpose as a cue ball. Of course, I hit a little harder. I didn't want to get stuck behind the one. Now, an eight ball, it's called gentleman or gentle person's call. You know, you do have to call your shots, but if it's obvious, you don't have to call. Okay. And, and when you play a league, you got loud music playing or tournaments and stuff like that. But whenever you have a combination or a bank or something more difficult, you definitely have to call your shots. And also, you have to call the eight. All right. But generally, if the shots are obvious, then, then that's the way it works. Now, let's look at a couple of possibilities that might happen along the way. Pass on the last day to do that. Anyway, any questions about anything? The working back yeah. from your yeah. eight ball, like in other games, extremely deep, straight pool. Yeah. Do you still do a work back? Strategy, oh, absolutely. Even though you've got 15 balls on the table? Well, at 15 balls, it's pretty hard because you've usually got clusters to break up, and that takes uh, number one priority. But once you get within six, seven balls of your break shot in the straight pool, then you, you really start, you know, you find your break ball, you, where's my key ball, and then what's leading to my key ball. So you really go backwards in a lot of games, especially eight balls. Okay. Because a lot of times in eight ball, balls will be tied up terribly and you have absolutely no chance of running out. So sometimes it's better to miss or, or you know, play some sort of safety. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Pete, would you talk yeah. more about, uh, you said a cluster, breaking up a cluster would be your first priority? Yeah, if we had a game of eight ball and let's say I had something like this. Uh, Sometimes I think leaving it to my opponent to deal with is my top priority. Well, a cluster, when I say cluster in eight ball, it's your cluster. You already oh, is. Okay. You no, know, in other words, like a shot like this. You know, this is a shot that has a reasonable opportunity. I'm not, you know, both balls are unmakeable, yeah. but all I have to do is, you know, you know, hit it and you know, bump that six a little bit. And now I did yeah. you use any right I did. I had to use it. And see, in that case, I did open it up enough to make a ball. Okay. And you know, from here, I could just roll forward a little bit like that. And then I got a pretty good shape on the game. You see how that works? There was a reasonable chance to, to win the game, but a lot of times there is no reasonable chance. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Good question. Good question. Anything else? Here's a shot that comes up a lot that sometimes people don't see. It's kind of one of those game-winning shots that we talked about earlier. Yeah, here's a shot where I have stripes. Well, right here. What would you do in this this situation? Uh, carrying the 15 off the 13. Exactly, exactly. And it's a very simple shot. The problem here will so be getting shape on the 13. Remember what we That's learned about the tangent line? The tangent line will be from the contact point where the 15 hits the 13, going straight to the middle of the pocket. So all they have to do on this shot is hit the 15 right into that contact point that will tangent it straight into the corner pocket. Like that. And that's a, a way that I could actually win the game. Now I can play the 13 up there and draw back and play the 8. But always be, be aware of those because they, they come up all over the place. Here's two balls. Let's say I have solids and I'm here in this position. Let me uh, move the ball a little bit so it's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, you'll notice the line between the two balls, the tangent line takes it right to the center of the pocket. There, that's perfect. 
So here's a chance to actually win the game. All I have to do is hit a stop, stop shot here, and it should go right in the side pocket. Don't scratch. <laughs> you get the idea. Are you counting on the overall to push? To first push Actually, the, uh, that's, the that's an advanced oh. question. Thank you. But uh, Tim is right. If I use draw, it'll push the ball forward. So if the balls are like this, short of the pocket, like that, then I would have to use low to make it push into the side pocket. See, that was aimed right here. But that low English, cue ball spinning backwards, made the obvious ball tear them off with forward English. Anything else? Warren, you got anything? No, I just I never uh, realized what it was doing there that you could actually uh, yeah. deflect it. Well, uh, if you're interested, I'll show you again. If it's too hard, it'll take longer. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. The only way to really learn those, you have to shoot them and practice them, like combinations. And that's what we're going to do next week. We're going to do combinations and bangs. But today, I, I'd like you to practice the follow shot, the stun shot, and the draw shot. And, uh, you know, have at it. <laughs> Anything else you want to ask? Because, yeah. Generally, uh, I got my issues, but for an average player, based on your experience instructing players over the years, what's the hardest part of the game for an average player to learn to advance to the next level? Oh, that's a great question. They, they try to do too much instead of uh, mastering the basics first. Like, uh, you know, I watch league and a lot of players, you know, think that all the extreme English is going to help them be a better player. But you know what? You have to master the, the vertical axis of the cue ball before you move on to that. Because English throws a lot of wrenches into the workings. One, number one is curve. Number two is deflection. Uh, number three is the effect on the cue ball. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, it's just really, you know, once you develop the, the uh, knowledge of the vertical axis, you, you simplify the game. And you begin, you begin to really master pocketing balls and playing position you know, without trying to overdo it with uh, fancy stuff. If you watch all the best players in the world, you'll notice that you know, they, they keep their Q-tips fairly near the center of the ball. Moscone said, what, 80% or something? Yeah. Good question, though. You know, that's a big one because uh, and the main thing I think about becoming a better player is, is passion, loving the game. You know, play a league, play a tournament, take a class, read a book, build some uh, tools to help your game. That's what really is the most important thing. And I, I know a lot of you have that passion. I know Warren does. I've seen him working really hard on this game. <laughs> and you too. Anything else? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I missed the first two lessons, yeah. so I, but that was an excellent uh, lesson on leaving, on yeah. ball control. But you said practically nothing about ball speed. Maybe I missed this in the other two, because I could have made any of those shots and then left the ball anywhere right. else in the table by not hitting it hard enough or hitting it too hard. Yeah. But you didn't put any emphasis on how hard you hit that cue ball is right. going to really, really affect oh, where... Oh, ab absolutely, it's crucial. Yeah. You know, and, uh, uh, like I said, I, any of those shots that you made, yeah. had you hit them less or more right. impact, it would have left a whole different position. Well, one thing I can tell you about speed control is that when you learn how to hit a stun shot or stop shot, speed control is not as crucial because you're controlling the cue ball by making it slow down after it hits the object ball. But whenever you're rolling the ball, 
like for example, a shot like this. If I'm going to roll the cue ball, it's going to go several, you know, right. right away. So you really have to, and how you control speed is this. Speed control is by the amount of stroke you put into it. Like for example, if I'm playing from the nine to the four, for position on the 14, this particular shot, I get my hand closer to the object ball, my back stroke is a lot slower, and my follow to is shorter. Because I didn't need a lot of stroke, okay? But, if let's say, here's an interesting shot. Let's say that I'm playing position from the 14 to the 15 in my big ball here. I'm going to have to hit this with quite a bit more stroke. So instead of a little short bridge like this and a real short stroke like that, it's going to be a little bit longer. The pendulum is going to swing back further and follow through more. So on this shot, I'm going to go about four rails around with more speed. So depending on the speed you want, the more portions of your stroke that will accelerate through the cue ball. And that's something that comes with practice, you know. <laughs> was the famous uh, pool player, Steve Miserak, always, you know, he's a world champion, he said practice, practice, practice. Yeah. And when you're, when you're rolling the cue ball, the positive part of that is that the pocket's more likely to take it because the object ball's not going so hard. But when you're rolling it, like for example, let's say I want to roll the cue ball down for the seven on the next shot. You got to keep the cue stick level. Now if I do this, if I elevate the back of the cue, it's going to slow down and stop real quickly. But if I keep the cue level, I don't even have to hit it hard. I can just do a nice, smooth stroke. See how easy I hit that and how far it went? That's because I kept the cue stick level. Whenever you jack up the back end, it tends to make the cue ball stun a little bit and slow down. Also, as a general rule, you never want to jack up your cue unless it's ne absolutely necessary because when you hit the ball, cue ball down like this, if you're off just a hair of your side, it'll make the cue ball curve. We call that a masse. So whenever possible, the rule of thumb is to keep your plastic as level as you can and your stroke as smooth as you can. And I'm not real good at it, also stay down, you know, just keep your head down until the ball hits the back of the pocket. That should be your cue that you can get up finally. Well, we covered a lot today. Are you ready to play some? All right, go for it. You got a choice.